So what are we going to think about this afternoon? Well, you might be thinking to yourself, well, well, what is the son of my right hand got to do with prophecy? Surely we want to be thinking about the things that are shortly going to happen. But in actual fact, this prophecy of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest prophecy that there is in the scriptures. Now we're very privileged, brethren and sisters, because we live at the end of an age. We live at the end of the epoch of men. But for 4,000 years, until the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, this prophecy, the prophecy of a saviour, the hope of Israel, was what motivated and what was considered by those that were of great faith. If you think back to Abraham and think back to the promises that God made to him, they were essentially about three different things. They were about a land. And we sometimes forget how important the land of Israel is in God's purpose and God's promises. But it was also about resurrection. God said to Abraham, though you're going to be old and you're going to die, and this land is going to be inherited by your um, descendants. Yet Abraham understood that he too would dwell in that land. So there had to be a resurrection, and that's demonstrated for us, isn't it? when he goes to offer Isaac. I and the lad will come again. Abraham staggered not at the thought that God could raise from the dead. But that offering of Isaac also pointed forward to that other great component that there needed to be in the hope of Israel. That there needed to be a saviour. There needed to be a one that was going to be Abraham's seed that would possess the gate of his enemy. And Abraham understood that the greatest of enemies was the enemy of death. When we come forward to 2 Samuel chapter 7, words again we're familiar with, for David, that promise of the seed, that promise of the saviour, is is fleshed out a little bit more. There are more words in 2 Samuel 7 for, for the faithful to consider, to think about. So turn with it, me, 2, 2nd of Samuel chapter 7. Words we're familiar with. We don't need to spend time looking at the detail. But God says in chapter 7 and verse 12, When thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. I will establish his kingdom. So there is again this seed that descends now not just from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but descends now from the house of David. And God says to to David, doesn't he, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And just at the middle of verse 16, thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. So again, David understands that there has to be this man, this one that's going to come from your bowels, he's going to be a human being, but he's going to be the one that's going to establish that kingdom forever. So not only is there resurrection, because it's going to be before David, it says in verse 16, but it's going to be someone who can live forever, that is no longer going to die. The one that will possess the gate of his enemies. And God says, perhaps a little enigmatically to David, but I don't know how much he understood. I think he probably understood more than we we perhaps give him credit for. But God says, I will be a father. Not just a physical father, I don't think, but, but a father in the sense of one that will nurture one that will, be bring, will bring up. One that will be a spiritual father. And so this great hope, this hope of the son of my right hand, was that great prophecy that through the ages, brethren and sisters and the righteous and the faithful would look to 
would look in hope that there would be the one that they would come to turn as the Messiah. In fact, in several other places, the scriptures talk of the work of the Lord Jesus as a nail in a sure place. As something upon which everything else hangs. From the very beginning to the very end, God's purpose was centred on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that great prophecy, that greatest of prophecies, is what we're going to consider this afternoon. But before we do that, I just want to have a little digression and just talk about our overall theme. Come with me to Matthew chapter 7. Again, their words are well known to us. But I just want to draw out one little point from Matthew chapter 7 that is of great import to us in these last days. Now we know the story. We know about the wide gate and we know about the narrow way. The narrow way is difficult to find. The Greek word has the idea of obstacles. There are obstacles around that that, that might stop us from seeing that narrow way. And we have to find it. We have to look diligently. And we have to disregard the seemingly broad way that seems more obvious. Because Jesus said, That broad way, that flat way, that spread out way, that that easy way. It only goes to one place. It goes to destruction. That word that we have for um, wide, verse 13, straight, or enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. That word that we have translated wide it comes from the, from the Greek word to be spread out, to be, to be flat, to be broad. But interestingly, it comes from the Greek word, or the root is rooted in the Greek word, plasso. Now, plasso is interesting because plasso means to mould, to fabricate, to, to make the shape that you want. I guess it's where we get the word plastic from, because plastic is moulded, isn't it? Plastic is injected into a mould and and is shaped into whatever shape you want it to be. Well, that's what the broad way is like. Interestingly, Jesus goes straight on afterwards, doesn't he, in verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Beware of pseudo-prophets. Beware of those that look like they're telling you about the truth, but are actually giving you a different gospel. A gospel that has been moulded Not to what God wants, but to what man wants. So when we hear of a different gospel, a modern interpretation of the gospel, new ideas, we ask ourselves, are they new ideas? Or are they just shaping the gospel to a a lesson or, or, or an idea that man wants to hear, rather than the straight and the narrow way that leads to life. So food for thought, brethren and sisters, as we go through. Let's think then about this promised seed, this greatest of the prophets, uh, prophecies, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in actual fact, to do it justice, we need to go all the way back to the very beginning, don't we? We need to go back to Genesis chapters 2 and chapter 3, because it is in here that God sets forth his principles. So we know these early chapters well, don't we? God puts forth one law, one principle. He says, doesn't he, in verse 17 of chapter 2, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The Hebrew is death. Death. There will be a consequence of death because of the disobedience of the commandment. And we know what happens, don't we, in chapter 3. There is this serpent. This serpent is different from the other beasts. The the scriptures say he's more subtle. Interestingly, the word serpent comes from a root of the idea of diligently observing. (coughs) So this serpent diligently observes all around it 
and he sees the evidence before his eyes and he sees that as being more important than the words of God that have been spoken to Adam and by extension to Eve that say you shan't eat of it. And the serpent says, well, I've thought about this, I've considered the evidence and I can tell you that what God says is not right. And so Adam and Eve follow after that, that incorrect analysis by the serpent. And so they are cursed, are they not? To return to the ground where they came from. That they go back to the dust. But this great prophecy of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ starts, doesn't it, in verse 15 of chapter 3. I will put enmity between thee, the serpent, and the woman. Between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Here we have this first prophecy of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice also what there is between these two uh, strands, as it were. Between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. There is enmity. There is a distrust, a a dislike, a, a hostility. And there are only two strands, aren't there, brethren and sisters? There's a binary choice. And the scriptures present a binary choice throughout. Man loves shades of grey. Where can we sit between black and white? Where does the shade of grey become something that is important? It becomes important in man's eyes. To God, there is no shades of grey. It is black or it is white. And so the scriptures talk about light or darkness and a dividing line between the two. Talk about evil and right. Life and death. These choices that the scriptures set forth are choices that we have to take hold of. There isn't a middle way between right and wrong. There is either right in the sight of God or wrong in the sight of God. Now, you can think to yourself, well, these are very much first principles that you're talking about. And that is true. But isn't it a tragedy, brethren and sisters, that in these last days, these basic first principles are being undermined within our community? There are those that say, well, you don't need to take Genesis literally. You don't need to understand that what God says here as as truth, that is absolute, it's a metaphor. God was just talking in language that, that people of the day could understand. We've moved on. We don't have to believe it. But I say to you, brethren and sisters, That if we take away these early chapters of the scriptures, we're taking away the start of all the great themes that work their way through the scriptures. First of all, we're we're destroying the principle of inspiration. Because we're saying, well, what God says, when he says it literally, isn't actually true. God says something, well, we don't have to believe that. What if... I don't want to believe chapter 1 and chapter 2. You could say, well, I don't want to believe chapters 5 or 6 or, or whatever it is. And the principle that God has inspired this scripture that it might give us life it is cast by the wayside. But more importantly, and more relevant to our consideration this afternoon, the work of the atonement is also cast away. Because throughout the scriptures, the scriptures provide for this one that would undo the work that has been brought about by Adam. By that sin that was brought in by them. So if we undo the sin and the, 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 the fall of Adam, we're also undoing 
the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I put also God manifestation. Because the whole principle of the scripture is that God will be glorified in those that accept his plan and his purpose and wish to glorify God acknowledging what they are. And what sort of God would we be manifesting if we say that death didn't come by the error of Adam and Eve? But we say instead that death is something that God created before Adam and Eve were ever made. You see, if we believe in theistic evolution, we put forward the idea of an unjust God. Because a belief in theistic evolution, of necessity, teaches that death had its hold upon men before sin. It puts forward a God that cursed men to death before they had fallen short of his law. He then allowed his only son to die to release men from his own work of corruption and death. Therefore, in this world, if death is an enemy, it is an enemy created by God alone. So we've cast away the atonement and we've cast away, brethren and sisters, the righteousness of God. And so we have serious issues within our community that would seek to destroy the truth. And we've been here before, brethren and sisters. This is nothing new. You might think back to the 60s and think, well, again, it reared his head then. But you can go back all the way to 1896 and what's called the Cornish heresy. And Brother Roberts writing... um, in, uh, in his diaries of his journeys to the, uh, to, the, to the colonies, as it was called, talked about coming across this man, George Cornish, who denied the sacrifice of Christ, maintaining that Christ died not as God's arrangement for the forgiveness of our sins, the atonement, but because he was killed. And Brother Roberts goes on to say that this idea is reached in the case of the truth through a plausible theory to the effect that we do not inherit death from Adam by any physical law, but merely by the denial of access to the tree of life. That the sentence of death took no effect on Adam's body, and therefore is not in ours. And so there will be those that say, well no, death is just about not being able to to take of the tree of life. And that undermines what God says of our nature. Brother Roberts goes on to say that our nature in this case, and this theory, is not unclean and is not a sinful nature. There's no such thing as sin in the flesh or sinful flesh or sin that dwells in us. It completely alters our relationship with God. Because if we believe these ideas, we can say, well, well, we're very good. God made us very good, we're just the same. There isn't the corruption that needs to be undone by the work of the Lord Jesus. And Brother Roberts going on to say that uh, when, he, when he interviewed this, this uh, Mr Cornish, he calls him now. Uh, he won't even call him Brother Cornish. Mr Cornish. He says at this point, I refuse to go further because the impassable gulf of divergence thus suddenly revealed. In other words, the truth was lost in that man. And brethren and sisters, if we seek to unpick the golden threads that start off in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3, we come to the point by unpicking those threads that the wonderful gospel that is knitly bound together around the work of the Lord Jesus Christ ends up as being mere threads upon the floor. There is nothing there to say. And death is our only hope. Brethren and sisters, we have to make a choice in these last days. Are we going to let the truth slip from our fingers and embrace error? Or are we going to hold fast to the inspired word of God 
as given by the Almighty God. Those words that give us that hope of salvation. So let's look to more wonderful things, more glorious and edifying things, and think of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the title has in it the man of my right hand. So I want to start us off by looking and learning about right and left in the scriptures. Now you might think that you know your right and your left, but we're perhaps going to to tease out a little bit more uh, meaning and understanding from the scriptures. Come with me first of all to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis 24 is interesting. It's um, the account of Abraham's servant going to, to find a wife for Isaac. And it just contains a little little phrase that just gives us an idea of how God's word directs us in our lives. So he, he's, he, he's there, he, he's um, found uh, a wife for Isaac, and, and he says to the family uh, in verse uh, 49, Now, if ye will deal kindly and truly, truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me. So, so, so if you're going to do this, tell me. And if you're going to do that, Tell me, so, so give me, give me direction as to what I should do, that I may turn to the right hand or turn to the left hand. So, in other words, what Abraham's servant is saying is, is give me direction, give me instruction that he might give me direction in my life, so that that if I need to turn left, I will turn left, and if I need to turn to the right, I will turn to the right. So here we have an understanding of the direction that is given by, when we're looking at God's word, by the commands of God. Deuteronomy 17, well known to us, um, is is building upon that and saying, well, once you've got that direction, once you've got God's word that says, well, in this circumstance you must do this, and in that circumstance you must do that, then once you understand that, you've got another thing that you need to be aware of. Verse uh, 11. According to the sentence of the law, which they shall teach thee, and according to the judgment, which they shall teach, they shall tell thee, thou shalt do. So here you are, listen to the instructions, and do them. Thou shalt not decline from the sentence which they shall show thee, to the right hand or to the left. So so once you know and you understand the path that God has in mind, you mustn't deviate from it. It's going back to our idea of, of, of the narrow way, isn't it? We can't just wander off in whatever way we want. We have to keep to the narrow way. We have to keep to the instructions of God. And not as it were put our own spin on it, that we might go off in a different direction and say, well, I know better than what God said in these circumstances. Turn with me now to Job chapter 40. Here we have a little bit more instruction of this idea of the right hand. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the man of God's right hand. So in chapter 40 of Job, God appears to Job to show him God's glory and God's might. And so in verse 9, God poses a question to Job. Hast thou an arm like God? Or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency, and array thyself with glory and beauty. In other words, he's inviting Job and and saying to him, What what is your arm like mine, Job? Can you do the things that I do, Job? Do you have the might and the majesty that I have, Job? And God says, Well, if you do, Job, I'll admit something to you. I'll admit to you, verse 14, 
Then will I also confess unto thee that thine own right hand can save thee. So could Job do those things that God could do? No, he couldn't. So was Job Job able by his own right hand to save himself? No, he wasn't. God is making it clear that the work of salvation, the work of saving, is only going to be done by that which that one which God would raise up to be on his right hand. He would be the one that could save. So we come to think of that one that we read together of in um, Psalm uh, 80. Don't turn uh, to it at the moment. We will come back to it uh, in a little while. So in Psalm 80, we're told, let thy hand, God's hand, be upon the man of thy, God's, right hand. So if we look at the Hebrew, we shall see that when it says, let thy hand, let God's hand, is the word yad. It means an open hand. It means a hand that gives direction. And being the right hand, it has the inference that, that this is the powerful hand. This is the hand of strength. This is the hand that is, as it were, more dexterous able to accomplish that which it needs to be done. So God's hand is going to have power and direction upon whom? The man. It is not any man. It's the man. The individual man. The Lord Jesus Christ. So we've been told here that that God's powerful hand is going to be upon this individual man and he's going to be the man of the right hand or in the Hebrew it's, it's one word, yamin it is the right hand and what does that mean? well we think well, relatively obvious right hand, translated in the scriptures means the right hand or, or the right hand side the stronger side sometimes because most of us are right handed are stronger on the right hand But notice, it also means something quite strange. It means locally, the south. So if the right hand is the south hand, then what direction have we got to be pointing in? That was a rhetorical question, but everybody wants to tell me, then they can. So if the right hand is south, which direction are we pointing in? Okay, I'll tell you, east. Okay, so if, you ha- if your hand's to the south, you're, fo- you're facing east. So the man of the right hand, or the man with the right hand, is facing towards the east. Why would he be facing towards the east? Well, in actual fact, when you have the tabernacle and the temple, you normally face in towards the west. Why is the man of the right hand facing east? Come with me to Ezekiel 43. What are the faithful looking for? The faithful are looking for the glory of God to be manifested and to be revealed in this world. They look for the hope of Israel to be established. And so in Ezekiel chapter 43... Ezekiel looks towards the east. So it says afterwards, verse 1, he brought me to the gate, even to the gate, that looks towards the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like the noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. Uh, And then if we just go to verse 4, And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect 
is towards the east. And the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord, the glory of Yahweh, the glory of he who shall be, filled the house. So that is the hope of the followers of God, the faithful. They look to the east. They look for the time when God's glory shall fill the earth. Now interestingly, if we look at the Hebrew for left, those concepts are reinforced. So the Hebrew word for for left, in my terrible pronunciation, is smozzle, um, which I think is a lovely word, smozzle. And smozzle, your left hand, has the idea of darkness. Something that's enveloped in darkness. Now actually, when you think about it, that makes sense. If you've got a man who is facing east, and his right hand is facing south, then naturally speaking, when the sun rises in the east, it's going to come round towards the south, and then it's going to go all the way round to the west. The right hand is always in the light, but the left hand is always in the darkness. So the right hand is the strong hand that is able to bring life, that has the idea of light and has the idea of God's salvation. And the left hand has the idea of weakness and darkness. And so we understand better right hand and left hand in the scriptures. And with that, let's go to the Psalms. First of all, let's come to Psalm 16. Now we know now what the, what the, the Hebrews would have understood by uh, the, the idea of right and left. To us in English, right perhaps didn't mean much. Now we know that salvation is going to come by the man of God's right hand and has the idea of um, looking eastward. So Psalm 16 and verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand I shall not be moved. And verse 11 Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So notice what the psalmist says, especially what the psalmist says in verse 8. I've set the Lord always before me. I'm looking towards the Lord and his right hand uh, is uh, is there, isn't it? Uh, He's before me and his right hand is there. So so we have, uh, as per the diagram on the screen, the idea that the man that is faithful is looking eastwards because he's got his right hand towards the south. And he's looking towards the salvation of God. And and he says, well, well, God's looking towards me. So so God must be, as it were, looking the other way. Towards the man or the woman that is faithfully seeking after God. But it talks about his right hand, doesn't it? And so, as it were, as I draw it on there, the right hand of God is near to the right hand of man. That there should be a partnership together. And I think it's beautiful, isn't it? When we have uh, baptisms, we have a receiving in, and we extend the right hand of fellowship, don't we? And, and the older brother stands there, and, and he gives his right hand to the young brother or young sister, and shakes their hand, extends the right hand of fellowship. He's picking up on these beautiful themes. So, Psalm 17 and verse 7. Again, uh, uh, similar words. Show thy marvellous loving kindness, verse 7, O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee against those that rise up against them. So now we see the idea of that right hand of God being extended out. To, as it were, save, to to draw, to, to grab hold of. Those that are faithful and look to God for their salvation. 
Now come forward to Psalm 63. Now when we come to Psalm 63, the person that is being talked about is the Lord Jesus Christ. And obviously when the psalm was written, it was a psalm of David. It is David or the Lord Jesus Christ that are that is where echoing these words. So verse 1. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. Now rising up early is one of those scriptural phrases, isn't it? Abraham rose early in the morning when he had to go and offer Isaac. Rising up early is, is associated with people deciding to do what needs to be done in terms of God's commands. But when you rise up early, you see the sunrise. You see the sun rising in the east. The new day that God has brought. So the Lord Jesus and David, by, um, when penning his psalm, says, Early will I seek my God. My soul thirsteth for me, my flesh longeth for thee, in a dry and a thirsty land where no water to see thy power and thy glory. So we're back to that idea of glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. And then he goes on in verse 7. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Now we haven't got time to follow the idea of the shadow of God's wings. But again, that there are verses that talk about being under the shadow of God's right hand. That is where God is providing protection and shade from the the harshness of the sun by his right hand. Verse 8, My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. So again, for David and for the Lord Jesus Christ, there is that idea that God's arm God's strength is upholding them during their lives. Now we will come back to Psalm 80, because you're going to notice we're going to skip over Psalm 80 and go to Psalm 110. And don't worry, we are going to come back and spend some time looking at Psalm 80. I just want to pick up this idea that's brought out, slightly different, in Psalm 110. Again, a psalm of David, words that are well known to us and are quoted by the Lord Jesus of himself. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So we go back to the promises of Abraham, don't we? That they will sit in the gate of his enemies. And we have an invitation. That David is looking on and saying, The Lord, the Almighty God, says to to, to my Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, sit thou on my right hand. So we have a picture of David being that faithful one whose right hand is towards the south, looking for the salvation of God. And God, he's already said, God's face is towards me because I'm looking for for him. And God's saying to, to, to the Lord Jesus, my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand. So we have the Lord Jesus now in the same position as the Almighty Lord God. So so, so the side has been switched, as it were. When when Jesus was um, in his ministry, he he was in the position that David was in, looking towards his God for salvation. Now, as he is raised and, and, and is made immortal, God gives him this invitation. Come, sit at my right hand. So I make thine enemies thy footstool. And so the side is switched by the Lord Jesus. Interestingly, when we think about the return of the Lord Jesus, and we think about those, about those words of Ezekiel, he comes back from the east, back to this earth, to, 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 to be revealed in God's temple. But here, in Psalm 110, we have the Lord Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Almighty God, ruling until that great enemy is destroyed. Now, interestingly, when we think about the tabernacle, and we think about the temple, 
I said to you that then normally um, you're, you're coming, um, the, the temple is, is facing in the direction west, isn't it? But it faces in that direction for a particular reason. Because the priest has to come in from the east towards the most holy place. So the Lord Jesus, in that great work of salvation, is coming from the east towards the most holy place. So so it follows the path of the priest coming in to the temple tabernacle or to the temple. God's salvation is at the hand of the Lord Jesus. Now we're going to turn our attention to Psalm 60. But before we do that, I want us to go back to Genesis chapter 48. Because when we come to Psalm 60, we will see a lot of ideas and allusions from the blessing of of Joseph, or the blessing to Joseph, from Jacob in Genesis 48. You remember how Psalm uh, 80 starts, it talks about the God who is the shepherd of Joseph. So Joseph features in Psalm 80, we'll pick that up when we come to Psalm 80, but let's just have a look at the background here. The Genesis chapter 48 is about... um, Jacob giving blessings to his sons. So we just we're going to spend five minutes in just teasing a few things out here. So uh, don't think I've forgotten Psalm six, Psalm eighty. We will get there in the end. But uh, let's just look at uh, verse um, three uh, to start off with. So Jacob's old. Joseph's been told your father's um, uh, dying. Come for the blessing. And Jacob said unto Joseph in verse three. God Almighty appeared to me at Luz, that's Bethel, in the land of Canaan, and blessed me. And said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, and I will make thee a multitude of people, and I will give this land to thy seed after thee, for an everlasting possession. So Jacob starts off this blessing by by drawing Joseph's attention to something that Joseph would know already. But Jacob says, God has given through me a a great purpose. It's twofold. It's a multitude of people and it's an everlasting possession. Now that word multitude of people has the idea of a congregation. An assembly of people can sometimes, it can be just an assembly of people, but, but it also has the idea in the scriptures of an assembly of people who are coming to worship God, and more specifically, I think, to coming to worship God to recognise the hand of God in their salvation. Now, we haven't got time to, to turn to these references, but Exodus chapter 12 uses that word congregation of the children of Israel when they remember the Passover. They're remembering their salvation from Egypt. They're remembering what had to be done to that land. And they're remembering that because of that Passover, they were saved from the land of Egypt. That word congregation is also used in the most solemn day in the Jewish calendar, In Leviticus 16, it is used of the Day of Atonement. That day, when the high priest, in his not in his normal wear, but in his just his simple linen clothes, goes in alone into the most holy place to offer for the sins of the people. And the congregation of the nation of Israel stand and witness what has been done for them. On the Day of Atonement and the Day of the Passover, it is a lamb that is slain. But those of us who are blessed with being able to understand these things know that those two great events point forward 
to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That one who alone was offered that his people might be saved. So Jacob is told by God that you are going to have a congregation of people. It's not just the physical nation of Israel. It's about the people that are called out for God's name and who recognise the need for the work of the Saviour, who recognise the need for the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is one point of the things that that, uh, Jacob brings to Joseph's attention. The other thing is an everlasting possession. It's interesting how often the land comes back again and again to be part of those promises. An everlasting possession. That's only used three times in the scriptures, brethren and sisters, an everlasting possession. One is when it's when Abraham is told, I'm going to give you an everlasting possession. It's here. And the other time is in Leviticus. Uh, and uh, uh, the reference escapes me, but you can ask me afterwards and I'll found it by then. Uh, but it's Leviticus 25. I just found it. Where it talks about, uh, it's talking about Leviticus 25, the Jubilees. But it says of buying and selling things, you know, you could sell your land and you got it back at the Jubilee. But it says of the possession of the Levites, that which was outside the city, you can't sell that if you're a Levite. You can't sell that land because that's an everlasting possession. The everlasting possession of the Levite, those that would serve God, those that were the faithful ones of God, is the land of Israel. Which is why Daniel, at the end of his prophecy, talks about the day when he will stand in his lot, when he will receive the portion of the land of Israel that is promised to the faithful. So so Jacob is drawing Joseph's attention to these two things. The congregation is going to look on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the land and the possession of the land that is promised to the faithful. So, With that start, Jacob then says something very strange in verse 5. Now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born to thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they be mine. Which is why we have the tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. Because Jacob's saying, they're going to be counted as my sons. And isn't it interesting, when we come to um, Psalm 80, it's Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh that are talked of. These three sons of Jacob. One of which is named Benjamin, the son of my right hand. Isn't that interesting in the context? Now, Time is going, uh, and uh, we need to just uh, cover off uh, a little bit more in this chapter. We know the the incident well, that Joseph brings Ephraim and Manasseh to um, uh, be brought before him. And Joseph puts his sons so that Jacob can put the right hand of blessing upon Manasseh. Because Manasseh is the elder. And we, know we haven't got time to look at it, but we know the instant that Jacob wittingly takes his right hand and he puts it on the hand, head of Ephraim instead. So the blessing of the right hand goes to Ephraim. And what is the blessing of the right hand that he gives? Well, we're told in verse 16. The angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them, and the name of our fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So there are two things that Jacob brings attention to in this blessing. First of all, it's the angel which redeemed me we haven't got time to go back to Genesis chapter 28 
But there we have the angel of the Lord that appears to Jacob. But Jacob here says it's about redemption. It's the Hebrew word gar. It's the first time it's mentioned in the scripture. So we have Jacob talking about a redeemer. The word gal is, is used in Ruth of Boaz, the redeemer. The one that buys back. The one that purchases for a price. The one that raises up for a name the seed of the one that is dead. And isn't that the work of the Lord Jesus? That the seeds of those that are dead, the seeds of, of Adam, have a progeny raised up by the Redeemer that they might have life. So redemption is talked about in this blessing. But also, he says, by my name shall they be known. My name, Israel. Come back with me to chapter 32 of Genesis. Verse 28. Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And the margin tells us, doesn't it, that Israel means prince of God. Strong's tells us that the meaning is he will rule as God. He will rule as God. Well, that is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? He rules on God's behalf. He is the one who will be king of the earth that rules on behalf of his father. Jusinius gives it a, a, a bit more of a, um, a, a meaning that is picked up with that idea of the power of God. Because Jusinius says that Israel means a contender, a soldier of God, and it comes from the root to fight. So those that are named the name of Israel are the ones that will fight on behalf of the things of God. So we see contention, we see difficulty, we see having to to make decisions about salvation. So come with me now to just spend our final five minutes or so looking at this Psalm 80. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock. So the first thing that we notice is God is the one that is the shepherd. He's the shepherd of Israel, and he's also the shepherd of Joseph. Now when we think of the work of Joseph, we think of the one that was made separate from his brethren, that he might save the nation of Israel. And we see in the work of Joseph a great type of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But who was the shepherd of Joseph? Who was the one to whom Joseph came close to? It was the Almighty God, wasn't it? And it was the same for the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our shepherd. He is the one that that leads us that he might save us. But he too had to have someone to to, to lead him, to be his shepherd. who was the almighty God, who was a father to him. And then we have that injunction, don't we? Thou that dwellest between the cherubim, shine forth. So we've got to that idea of glory. Glory from God, that God might be manifest in those that follow him. And then, as I've remarked, Ephraim, Benjamin and Manasseh, are then mentioned, tying us back to Genesis. But what is the injunction of this psalm? Verse 3. Turn us again, O God. Turn us. Oh, sorry, cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. So there's three parts there, aren't there? There is a turning. Turn us again. It's mentioned in verse 3. 
it's mentioned in verse 7, turn us again, and it's mentioned at the very end, verse 19. So this hope of being, or manifesting that one that shines between the cherubim, is centred upon the need to be turned. That word that we have, turn us, actually has the idea of turning around or returning. It actually, in its negative context, is first used uh, in Genesis, where they're told you're going to return to the ground. So that is our natural state, isn't it? We're walking towards the grave. And the injunction of the psalmist, turn us. Turn us around. Turn us around from the ways of man, that we might turn and follow the ways of God. So we're walking away from the glory of God. And the psalmist says, turn us. Turn us round. We might see the face of God shine upon us. So turn us to the east. We might be able to see the glory of God. And we shall be saved. The salvation is coming from the east. We have to turn towards it. And God will provide that salvation. But then at the end of this psalm, we have these interesting words, don't we? Verse 14, return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts, look down from heaven, behold and visit this vine and the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted. So we have a vine and we have a vineyard. Now we know from the prophets that that Israel should have been that vineyard that manifested God's glory. That there was that righteous people that was filled with the things of God. Because when we come to the New Testament, we have the Lord Jesus saying that I am the true vine. The Lord Jesus is, is the vine. But the Lord Jesus goes on to say, well, you've got to be part of me. So in that vineyard, as it were, there needs to be a vine that that has its branches, as it were, rooted in in the work of the Lord Jesus. So that we have to be part of his vine. There is no other salvation except through him, because this vine is special. Because, verse 15, the vineyard which thou hast planted, thy right hand has planted, and the branch that thou made strong for thyself. So we have a branch. It's actually in the Hebrew, it's the word ben. It's the sun. A sun that has been made strong for God. That word sun comes from the root of of a banner, which has the idea of building a house. So God is building a house that is centred in this vine... And it's been made strong. Made strong by God for himself. So we have this idea of God's work in salvation is for God. It's God that is glorified through that work. And our salvation is about being or manifesting the glory of God. Our salvation isn't for us ourselves Particularly, although obviously it is a great benefit for us. But our salvation is about the glorification of God. It was Brother Thomas that said, wasn't it? That it's, it's God manifestation, not human salvation, that is the primary work that is going on here. We will be glorified, but not glorified for ourselves. We will be glorified for God, to manifest God's character. So in verse 17, let thy hand, thy open strong hand, be upon the man, the Lord Jesus Christ, of thy right hand, the one that is strong, that is able to save, and upon the son of man, or just Ben, the son, that one son, whom thou hast made strong for thyself, for thy glorification, that all nations should know and understand the might and the majesty of God. And so if we just finally just turn over to Psalm 98, we see 
All of these things brought together in beautiful words of the psalmist. O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvellous things. The Almighty God has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. And all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our Lord. The son of the right hand is the greatest of all the prophecies. It is centred on the work of the Lord Jesus. And part of that work has already been done. The Lord Jesus gave himself and has been glorified by God because of that acceptable sacrifice. But that great part to come is that time when the salvation of God and the glory of God will be manifested from Jerusalem to all the ends of the earth. What a wonderful and beautiful prophecy that still has to be fulfilled.